625. So the press can't start off at really late. I said the press can't write really late. The press needs to write. Meaning? Yeah, yeah. I'm joking. I got you. Here. Mm -hmm. Six. So you'll take over six thirty on the nose? Yeah. Okay. At six thirty, I'll call you when you're on How you doing? What? <laughs> Hello, lady. She's, she's getting our pictures. Uh -huh. <laughs> Photograph. <laughs> I'm really excited for you. Ooh, this is a lot of people. I'm more than I'm excited. excited. I'm like, we're last day on my stage, right? You know how I know. I'm like, hey. That's why I'm so excited. So. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? First of all, welcome. My name is Rick Martin. I'm Director of Communications and Community Relations for Douglas County. We are very happy to have you all here for the first Walking the Talk listening session with Chairman Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones for the year. Thank you so much for being here. We will begin now, but before we begin, let me tell you what's gonna happen. I'm gonna present some of our guests here, the panelists. I'm gonna let you know that you will be able to hear what they have to say, what questions they have to answer from here, from this microphone. When we get to the citizens, question and answer. Citizens one by one will be able to step to that microphone right there 
and ask their question, where Chairman Jones will answer. Sitting with us here, to my far left, Jennifer Hallman, Director of Finance. Next to Ms. Hallman, Gary Watson, specifically. Gary's our Director of Rideshare Program. To my right, Bobby Holmes, Major Bobby Holmes of the Douglas County Sheriff's Department. To his right, Mr. Miguel Valentin, Director of Department of Transportation. And to his right, Mr. David Good, Communications SPLOS Director. Last but not least, Tiffany, we also have Tiffany, Tiffany Stanley Stewart in the back, our Director of, <laughs> Director of External Affairs. Last but not least, Chairman Jones. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Evening. Happy New Year and welcome to my first walk in the talk listening session, session of the year. And again, I am Dr. Ramona Jackson Jones, Douglas County Board of Commission Chairman. And I'm delighted to host this informative and engaging town hall meeting, or should I say my first walking the talk listening session for the year. Tonight, as uh, my director of communication, um, communications just stated, you will hear from key directors, uh, department directors, and they will sh shed light on their perspective, areas of, areas of responsibility, and respond to some of your, of your concerns that you may have addressed through your emails, and your social media. Uh, of course, the highlight of the discussion will be uh, related to the proposed intermodal uh, bus, I call it bus minivan system. However, we will discuss other topics as well. I really appreciate your attendance tonight. I haven't had this much <coughs> attendance since my wedding, so thank you. <laughs> I am so pleased that you're here tonight. Uh, but, but before we kick the night off, I would like to make you aware of a few house rules. That's number one, keep the phone, turn the phone up. <laughs> please silence all your phones, please. That will help us to remain focused through this session. I'm, I talked to a couple of concerned citizens and I told you I would promise you at least from 6.30 to 9.30, but I know a lot of you all have to go to work, so we'll do our best to expedite and speed it along, but also make sure we cover all the the points that you're interested in tonight. Um, after each presentation, we will take questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, so as my directors uh, present, please feel free. We, we're just trying to make sure we don't get a thousand questions for one particular one because the, the, the bus proposed bus system is the last on the agenda as most of you see, and I know you're anxious for, to get that, uh, to that particular part. Please keep in mind your, uh, the responses will be fact-based tonight, and this is not a debate. So if we look into debate and go back and forth, I needed you all in this room in 2015 when this system came alive. So uh, I feel on it. Uh, I'll have to tout to my fellow commissioners that I said I am more popular than you are because they very seldom get this many people in a room at a time, so I'm just anxious and so happy that you're here. Um, certainly you have an opportunity to share your concerns, but I have spent my entire, entire life in surgery separating emotion from responsibility. So if you could just do that, keep your emotion down so it won't get hyped up and wild in here. I have, you see I'm layered with uh, deputy sheriffs tonight. And I did that on purpose because I want to make sure that we just keep this room the way it should be. This is an information system. 2015, some of us missed the mark. We were asleep at the wheel. So a lot of this, as I researched and pulled the information from 2015, I said, ooh, I was working at Children's Health Care of Atlanta, and I was busy, and I didn't see a lot of this. So I will discuss this with you tonight as we go forth. And over the last several weeks, I have responded to many of your emails, and you probably said, wow, that chairman is on the ball. I, that's what I like to do. I want to make sure that I keep you openly engaged. I'm very transparent, and you can see that by all the, the work sessions are open to you now. You're able to see that, and that you never had that privilege. And maybe that's why the room is full, and I'm so excited about that. Uh, I respect your conviction, but most importantly, I'm so glad that you will you're here tonight to hear the facts and see the documentation to support the narratives that are presented tonight. 
with no further ado, I would like my transportation director, uh, Miguel, Director Miguel Valentina, please come up and he'll speak about transportation in Douglas County. And you, if you have some questions about what's going on with transportation, he will be more than happy to address that. Okay, thank you. You need some water? Thank you, Chairman Jones. Again, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Miguel Valentin, also known as the new transportation guy. Uh, a lot of the uh, preliminary work related to a lot of the transportation projects was done many, many years ago. So I can't take credit for it. Hopefully, I will not be blamed for it either. But. Uh, the transportation department is multifaceted. We handle the more routine pothole repairs, signage, traffic signal maintenance, road maintenance. We also handle the planning elements for future projects, improvement projects, um, signal projects, road widenings, and the like. And there are many, many projects that are, have been in the works for years, such as Lee Road, for example. So we, over the years, continue to move those projects along from the planning phase, well, initially from the concept phase. And the way those projects are developed is citizens like you or technicians like some of my staff will come across an issue, a problem, and it gets noted, it gets highlighted, and then we begin to put together a solution. Now, transportation is a long-term proposition. Transportation planning takes many, many years. In particular, if the funding is to come from sources other than the county, and that is what we usually like to do. We like to take the local dollars, the tax dollars, keep those low, and leverage with federal funds. Now, in order to do that, we have to follow the federal procedure. And sometimes that adds many, many years to the process. So it is not unusual to have a transportation project from the time that you notice a problem, an issue out on the road, to it being resolved as a project to construction to take five to 10 years. That's not unusual. So again, it's a long-term proposition and you have to have the uh, vision to continue, the stamina to continue uh, to find the solution to those problems. So there are the, the things that we deal with that are fairly quick fixes like fixing a pothole, of course, Many of you may have called several times about one, the same pothole. And uh, you may wonder, well, how, how simple is it that to fix? Um, usually within 24 hours, we fix, get to those potholes. So that's a quick fix. The transportation long term could take, again, five to 10 years. Now, one of the things that um, we have to deal with is during the design phase, we have to go out and engage the public about a particular solution at a particular intersection or a corridor. And all of those things, we take input from the public and then we finalize the plan and then comes the hard part, finding the funding to deliver those projects. And um, some of them are very, very expensive, for example, the initial estimate for Lee Road overall was about 18 million. Well, it's probably closer to 30 million by the time we get done with it. So we have to continue the process, be patient, and eventually we'll get to the solution. Another facet of the transportation department's functions is the road resurfacing, subdivision roads resurfacing, major thoroughfares collector roads, arterial roads, resurfacing and reconstruction. Last year, and again, I said I'm, I'm the new guy in the sense that I 
was not part of the process initially, but I'm having to uh, continue the process as, as we do. And uh, initially we, I believe, targeted 127 roads for reconstruction in 2017. Well, you may recall that there was a lot of heavy rain early on uh, in the spring and summer, so we didn't get to do all of them, but we have completed 90 of those roads. And they have been done by in-house forces. So county crews with county equipment doing the work, 90 roads, about 18 miles. We still have another 37 roads to complete in the spring. In 2018, we have another batch of roads to do. Another about 16 miles of roads that we're gonna resurface through the splossed component of resurfacing and another 18 miles or so from the state grant for resurfacing known as uh, LMIG or Local Maintenance and Improvement Grant Program. So there is a lot of work that has been done that has been completed. There is a lot more that is coming and a lot more that is needed. The county has 717 miles of roads that we have to maintain. And so it takes time to cycle through them with the limited funding and the desire to keep the tax uh, expenditures low. Uh, therefore, one of the things that we normally do is take input from whether it be homeowner associations, residents, and uh, complaints about or a request to repave a certain road or a certain subdivision. And then we bring all of those requests together and we see how we can fit them in and how quickly we can get to them. But it does take, because of the funding and the number of roads, miles that we have, it does take a while. So that is another component of what we do in transportation. There's also as I mentioned, the long-term design of intersections, and we began this year with actual construction of some of those intersection improvements, such as the Riverside at Rock House um, road intersection and ins installation of a traffic signal there. there that's a difficult uh, intersection uh, configuration. So that project is underway now. Also, lighting, safety improvements along Riverside Road. That is also a SPLOST pro, uh, project that is underway uh, as we speak. So things that started several years ago are now beginning to be delivered, beginning to be constructed, solutions found, and we continue to work on many other longer term projects and solutions that will, be, uh, that will go to construction in future years. The other component of uh, transportation that we have in, in my department is in fact the transit component, uh, but I will not get into the details of that because we have a very competent person here who will speak uh, to those details a little later. So that will give you um, sort of an overview of the transportation department, the functions that we do and where we are relative to the resurfacing program and uh, pr the various projects. Um, that's all I have. Um, any questions from anyone? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, I do. Okay. I have a question about synchronization of the lights. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Uh, both of those locations are on state routes. 
And so the, the responsibility and the management rests with the Georgia DOT. However, they do have special programs to synchronize along certain major corridors, and it just so happens that Highway 5 is one of them. In fact, there's a meeting coming up tomorrow to discuss that they did a lot of um, background traffic studies and data gathering, and they came up with some solutions as to the signal timing, how this is going to be changed. The meeting is tomorrow, and the implementation will follow shortly thereafter. So hopefully, as it relates to Highway 5, that will help. The same is true along Thornton Road. There is another program where they're looking at, and, and they've already implemented some changes, uh, but uh, when, whenever you have the kind of traffic volume that you experience over on Thornton Road, and it is that close to the highway, so it, there is a confluence of traffic, it becomes very, very difficult. But to your question, it, it is something that has been heard before. It is something that is being addressed as best as, as the Georgia DOT can do. So thank you for that. We do. Uh, yes, we do. For example, whenever there is a concern from, from a resident, a citizen, or, or a motorist, or a visitor to, to the county that notices a problem, uh, if you call our department, the transportation department, we will take that information and relay it to GDOT. We will also give you their phone number to make sure that you're comfortable, that the, you're getting the message to them and we will follow up with them. Now, as it relates to projects, as I mentioned earlier, the way solutions to problems come about initially is folks like yourselves. And then we take that to the Georgia DOT and we meet with them periodically. And so we follow up and eventually, depending on the nature of the, of the, uh, of the issue, Eventually, we ensure that in, they incorporate that element into their program. Now, sometimes it takes a while, but if it is a safety consideration, something really urgent, then I've had meetings with them where they have decided right then and there that they are going to take that as a project and fund it. So they are responsive. We do communicate with them, and uh, we meet with them fairly regularly as well. Again, that, that is a, a GDOT uh, project. Uh, it is a long-term project. One, one of, if, if you're referring to the railroad uh, crossings that were uh, closed, is that? No, no. no. Okay, that, that I am not familiar with. I will have to follow up on that to see how, how soon they're going to be able to. Uh, I can tell you the, the biggest hurdle was getting the underpass uh, built because they were dealing with the railroad. That was hampering the progress, and, and that now is getting underway, so that should expedite other elements of the project. But I will follow up and, and try and find out what, uh, what the timeline is for that. But right now, I, I don't know. Did, 
the, well, that, that again, that, that project is a, a GDOT project. I do not have um, direct information as to exactly how long it's going to take them to complete it. Uh, the goal was to have started the underpass a year ago, so that I know that they are at least a year behind schedule. Um, so once they get that work underway, it's going to take about six months, I would say, to do the construction. So we're looking at a couple of years of additional construction if all goes well. Mm -hmm. We have one more question. Okay. Excuse me, before you begin, this, this uh, wonderful lady was waiting next in line, and I had promised her she would be next. Tass Miguel, thank you for your patience. And there's no other address, or we're taking the road that was really busy to begin with. And now, how are we planning on getting our truck in and out of there and not cause a hurry and mess? Yes. Uh, to answer both of your questions, uh, traffic is definitely uh, difficult in those areas, no question about it. I think the synchronization that I mentioned earlier is going to help. Now, in terms of people clogging up the intersection itself, that kind of becomes more an enforcement issue. Uh, and those intersections, at least the one on Highway 5, is, is in the city. So, uh, so it, it, one of the ways that I have seen that, that the issue is addressed is by painting a, a box in the middle of the intersection and, and saying, you know, putting up signs that say, don't, don't block the box. That is an approach that's been used uh, more recently. However, uh, people don't always read signs uh, really well, but it does become an enforcement issue. I, I do think that the timing, the retiming of the signals at those locations are going to help. So I, I think in the next few weeks you will notice some improvement. Uh, but those locations are going to continue to be difficult for sure. The trucks, they, they are absolutely. Again, that a development. Uh, No. Right. Yeah. When, when that development uh, comes online, it certainly is going to draw more trucks to that area. And, and whether they come out uh, through the Bright Star Connector or they go out to 78, loop around, a lot of them are going to be going back to I-20. Uh, so whether they come out of concourse uh, directly or they go around, eventually they're headed for the same area. So it becomes more of, more of an imperative to, uh, to control. Again, it, that development is in the city, so I, 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 don't, um, I don't know that there are specific plans to direct them in a particular way, but I got to believe that traffic will tend to disperse, and if they all come out, the Bryce Tar Connector, they're going to back up, and so some of them will probably go out 78 as well and perhaps find another way around. But, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Excuse me, um, ma'am, ma'am, this is Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones. This is my meeting, and it is set up in a format, and if you don't have, uh, where's my security? Can you move her out, out of here, please? Thank you. Bye. Next, we have, we have, next, I have another presentation. We are almost... We're about to get to the buses, but this, this meeting is not designed around buses. This is my walk in the talk session. I've been nice enough to do this. Your other commissioners didn't take this. So, so if you just, if you be patient and allow us, and allow us to finish my walk in the talk session, I would greatly appreciate it. Yes, we're trying. Now, if you all don't ask so many questions, we can go on to the next, to the buses. That's what I'm saying. So it's depending on you. So next I have Mr. Who do we have next? We have David uh, Good from, for the Splash. He'll give a quick update. And you, if you notice on your agendas, you see I have 10 minutes. I have it targeted for 10 minutes. So if we try to, uh, if you just rein your questions in for my uh, four directors, certainly you'll have an opportunity to work with me and Mr. Gary Watson, who's in charge of this bus system. So we'll just give us just a minute. I have, this is my meeting. These are planned monthly, and I don't want to disrupt my meeting. And I see you with a stare, sir, but I'm right there with you. I'm going to finish my meeting tonight. This is my meeting. OK. All right, thank you very much, Chairwoman. Uh, again, my name is uh, David Good, and I'm the, I'm the communication director for the 2016 SPLUS Communications Zone Program. And the main thing that I really want you guys to understand is that every single time I go out, I make sure that I take your concerns back to the commissioners. I make sure that anything that they are trying to get out to you guys is actually brought out to you guys. Um, one of the main things that we're bringing online is that, well, actually, first, how many people here know what the SPLUS program is? Okay, awesome. We're good. Most of you guys know about it. And of course, I mean, it was passed back in 2016. And what it is is that 51%, uh, which a little bit over half, goes towards transportation. 17% goes towards fire. And the last part of it goes to par towards parks and rec, which is about 17%. And what I do is I go out there to the community, go out to different events, whether it's going to be business, community, or if it's going to be other governments, I make sure that I bring out to them what is it the SPLOS program is going to do. And then I expect feedback from you guys telling me, well, this is what else that we see is needed in the county. Because maybe the first team did not get everything. So there are some things that we go ahead and uh, start and get straight. There was one person that came up and was talking about things along Georgia um, Highway 5 and Concourse. There are a lot of different intersections. I believe it's about, it's about nine of those intersections are actually on the SPLOS program in order to be dealt with. So therefore, there will be either intersection improvements, turning lanes. I know uh, one of them is actually going to impact Georgia Highway 5 and uh, Douglas Boulevard, which is one of the main areas where there's a lot of traffic. So we did hear your concerns about that, and we're going to make sure that is addressed within the program. Um, the other part is also right now we have some things that have already been taken care of. Uh, we actually have a ladder truck that's on its way here. It was about, it cost about $1.3 million, and we know that those are things that we definitely need. So if you've ever seen a, a large fire that goes over a warehouse, those ladder trucks actually can be gone over those tops of it could cause a warehouse not to burn down as quickly as they might. Um, the other part of it, of course, is the um, is over there at Boundary Waters. There will be a um, a rec center will go over to Boundary Waters, and then also a senior center will go over there where Cornerstone Baptist Church is, as well as a brand new fire station will be built out there on, um, I believe it's near Rock House Road over there in the, in the Riverside area. So those are really the projects that we have going on. I know there's a lot of concern about other issues, but I wanted to make sure I, I brought at least some information about the SPLOS program. And if there is a church 
All right, there's a church pastor here who wants me to come out there and bring out some information. I can. Uh, we actually have some cards that look like this that's over there on the back table uh, along with some pens. So if you go to the website, you will see all the information. So anything that you want to know about what intersections are actually on the list to be taken care of, you can go in there and find it. If you want to see how much has been spent out of this plot, you can actually see that information too. Uh, right now, before November came in, we were bringing in about $1.8 million um, you know, per, per month. And then when we got into November, we brought in a little bit over two, uh, two million. So therefore, we are getting back on track as far as the money to go into it. So I'm not going to take up too much more of you guys' time. Um, if there are any questions, please come into the mic and uh, we're willing, willing to answer it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, actually, that's not what this plus is for. This plus is actually for, for projects that are already uh, discussed, already put on this. Um, um, but both this, um, citizens of Douglas County as well as citizens from outside Douglas, about 60% of it. Oh, no, this is not about water. Let me, let me respond. Oh, go ahead. If I could just have your attention, please. In the interest of time, we're going to allow one question per person, just one. Ma'am, with all due respect, you asked it, we answered, Mr. Good answered. I'd like to request the next person, please. Okay? Please. Thank you, ma'am. We're sticking to SPLOST. We're sticking to the agenda. We are all being organized and we are all having the decorum necessary for this meeting to continue smoothly. Thank you all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. On to the tallest building. I'm not sure exactly how tall this capital is, but I do know that it's the standard that all um, large cities actually have as well. I'm not, I'm not sure how tall the actual truck is because I'm not in on that side. I'm just on the communication of what is coming, not on the design of it. I can, I can answer. I actually, I actually can answer that question. Chief Spencer is on his way out of town. If he hasn't arrived regarding the truck, he told me it's a truck that can reach the tallest building in the county. I can address that. That's as specific as I can get. Thank you, sir. With all due respect, sir. I'm asking one question per person. I'm on the same question. Does that include the new Google building, Riverside Drive? That specifically, I cannot answer. I do not answer. I do not know specifically, but I can connect with Chief Spencer to make sure that is answered to you. Okay. Feel free to see me after, sir. I appreciate it. Would you make that answer public? Yes, sir. Thank yes, you. I will. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, are there any further questions? All right, thank you very much. How are y'all doing tonight? Let's take a few minutes to talk a little bit about law enforcement and public safety and what we can provide for y'all here in this county. My name is Bobby Holmes. I'm a major with the sheriff's office here. I've been with the sheriff's office for about 32 years, and my background is basically mostly criminal investigations division and the command staff of the sheriff's office. So I've, I've been around a while. I've been we've worked with Sheriff Pounds along with I worked as far back as with Earl Lee. So a lot of experience here in this community. I've been one of the folks. I was not born in Douglas County, but I came through school in Douglas County High School and graduated, and I've been a member of this community for the last 35 years. So I'm. I'm with y'all understanding how this community changes over time. So um, with that said, um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. Uh, Madam Chair had asked me about some statistical data, which I'll speak briefly on in a few minutes. But I wanted to tell y'all about the Sheriff's Office a little bit. Your Sheriff's Office currently is about 380 positions. Currently, we don't have 380. We're, I believe from when I talked today, we're looking for about 30 to 35 people. And so if y'all know some folks, we would sure like to have them come forward and try to get some applications to come with us. Um, but your sheriff's office is closing in on about 400 members. 
Uh, if you haven't been in this community or haven't been here for the last 30 years, when I started, Sheriff, what did we have? 70 people in the whole department? Yeah, maybe 50. So we have grown as well as this community has grown. So I wanted to put that out here tonight. One of my folks, uh, Dwayne Wisenhunt, he's the other major in the back back there. Uh, we oversee the hiring in this agency, and we would love to see some local folks coming in and wanting to apply at this department. Um, uh, I came because I grew up in this community, and I love it, and I know there's people out here now that would like to do that, and we would sure wish that they would come forward, and law enforcement can be, even in this day and time, can be a very rewarding profession for folks. So I just want to get that out first tonight. Um, a couple of the, uh, the things that uh, Sheriff Pounds has instituted um, with us is one in particular, there's a new unit that we have called the SCOPE unit. And it's our Sheriff's Community Outreach. Tonight is an example of that. We're out here trying to get in with the, with, the, uh, with the community and try to give y'all some information to be able to answer some questions that you have regarding the law enforcement here in the community. Um, we work very closely with uh, the school systems, uh, with local businesses here in the community, uh, as well as subdivisions, neighborhoods. We go out, talk to folks, do homeowners association meetings. We will talk on crime. We will help try to give some input as to some things we can do in this community to help reduce the crime that uh, uh, we would love for it all to be gone, but we all realize that there's going to be some crime. We would try to minimize it as much as we possibly can. Um, a couple of the other things that the sheriff did with this administration was uh, we added a couple of traffic units that what we like to do, one of the things that we really stress in the, in the, is these high traffic and high, well, I won't say high crime, but problematic criminal areas sometimes. I know some folks think of Thornton Rose. It's probably the highest traffic area in the county. We have units that are specifically tasked with policing that area down there. Um, they work closely with that, and I'll give you an example from the holidays this year. I had some of my deputies that were coming back saying we're basically running each, into each other sometimes with these cars because we were blanking in that area. And I'll say one thing, and I told the sheriff about this in our recent command staff meeting. In November and December, which is always your high crime area when it comes to things like robberies and things like that, this county, the Douglas County, and I don't speak for the city of Douglasville or Villa Rica, but this Douglas County had two armed robberies in the months of November and December this year. One of those was a bank robbery many of you probably saw on the news where two people went into the, one of the banks across from the hospital and robbed it. We had one of those folks in custody. The other woman's still on the run. We had another robbery of a male person. That was it. In unincorporated Douglas County, in those two months, we did not have an armed robbery of a business. I don't know, uh, like I said, a lot of y'all don't um, probably keep up with that or on a day-to-day -day basis. That was an accomplishment this year. Um, and you know that's some of the things that we're trying to do at the Sheriff's Office to help the community. Um, the, um, uh, we have, you know, we have some other special units that we utilize, like crime suppression, who, again, we put them in problematic areas for criminal activity and things like that, um, our traffic safety units, and I think y'all sometimes see something out on the roads called the heat unit. That's our traffic to try and keep the roads safe for y'all. That was our unit that's dedicated to uh, DUIs, things like that. And, of course, I think y'all also see sometimes on the interstate our find unit. And that's our felony interdiction and detection of uh, narcotic. Felony interdiction narcotics detection unit. Yeah, uh, we've got an acronym, I think, for everything. But um, those units out um, seven days a week, uh, along with our patrol division, criminal investigations division, we try our best to try and make this community safe. Uh, like I said, I spoke about the robberies a minute ago. Just to give you a brief example of how that can work, and I think it worked very well this holiday season. Um, I think that um, there's um, – do you want to show that or, or not? That's fine. Um, I'll give you an idea. 2016 in Douglas County, there were nine homicides. That sounds like a lot, not when you compare it to some of these other metro counties. Um, in uh, 2017, we had six. Um, robberies were down, armed robberies were down, like I said earlier, in Douglas County. Uh, but one of the other things other than armed robberies is burglaries. We all want to be able to come home to our houses and have a place that we feel comfortable and not feel that somebody has uh, broken in and invaded our privacy. 
Um, that was another thing that we noticed as a result uh, of some of our changes in the way we enforce things. Um, our burglaries were way down this year, home residential burglaries, which was, which was very surprising. Um, you know, this is a big county. Um, there's a lot of unincorporated part of this county we have to cover. But our burglaries in 2016 were 324, and ours last year in 2017 were 226. That's for this whole county. And I believe this county is approaching 150,000 people. Um, I think you can take that kind of stuff and compare it. That's, that, there's a lot of work to be done. We all understand that. But that's showing some accomplishments of where uh, things are going uh, in this community. Um, and uh, I don't want to take too much time because I know I understand why a lot of the meeting is here tonight. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and take a few questions. Hi, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. to see if the police would come out. I don't know, I'm in the county, so it would be what, the sheriff, right? You're in the county, so okay. yeah, the unincorporated part would be the sheriff's office. Okay. Well, I made a call, and they, I had to describe what the activity was. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming because I made a call, I did talk to the operator, because I dialed 911, and the activity went on, and no one ever showed up. Yeah, uh, if you'll get with me... After this meeting, I'd like to have that information so I can track something, and I'll get back with you at the sheriff's office tomorrow. I'll give you a call back. Uh, if there was no response by our agency on that, then I'll look into that and make sure. So. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he may be walking up. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Uh, my question is related to the drug problem. Mm -hmm. Do you have any statistics on that in the county? No, for tonight's meeting, I didn't actually compile them. If you'll give me a contact, give me a call afterwards, I'll get in touch with you. Um, we have a, um, in, along with our criminal investigations division, we have our special investigations, which is our narcotics unit that works in conjunction with the city's narcotics unit. So um, we, we do have an active unit working on that, but to give you some numbers or stats tonight, I didn't come prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excuse me for interrupting, but we have the city. I'm the sheriff of this county. How are everybody doing? <laughs> and I'm and I'm standing here listening to the major talk, and a lot of these things are called administration change. I ain't gonna brag on, but that's a fact. And I'm gonna go on and tell you this right here too. The city, the chief, and I is working on a program. We already got some programs we implemented already such as the major crime unit. He got detectives on it, I got detectives on it, but if anything happened, city or county, that team worked that investigation. So now we're forming a drug task force just for the same reason that you spoke about, and eventually, maybe the next time she had this walk and talk, we'll have you some statistics and be able to show you the difference. We ain't gonna be able to stomp it out, or we're gonna put a dent in it. Oh, um, one other thing that Madam Chair wanted to make sure that I brought up is one of the things that talking about res the lady that was talking about a response time. Um, I'm sure some folks here are down from the Fair Play South part of the county area. One of the things that was done in the budget for this year was that they budgeted for four additional deputies, which is one per shift. And there's a new zone that's going to be listed as the Fair Play zone. It's basically pretty much kind of south of Dog River. <coughs> kind of west of the Dog River Bridge on 166, that area, which will have an extra deputy that is going to be assigned per shift to that to try and cut down on some of the call volume and some of the response times. I don't have any answer for that for you right now, I'll be honest with you. That's not something I have researched or whatever, so. The reason I asked is because it directly affected my family. I got it. Mm -hmm. Let me take it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just say thank you for that one question, okay? Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman. All right. We're going to have uh, Chairman Jones next.
What I'm going to do to uh, expedite time, I realize it is hot. It, uh, can we turn down the heat? Because uh, our citizens are hot, so I want to bring the heat down. We haven't even really started yet. Okay, I, what I'm going to do is just ask our, um, are you ready, finance director, if you could just come up and give, this leads into the bus. This talks about, uh, this, this will speak about the, the revenue, the, the general fund, you're concerned about money, are we broke, this. So she'll cover all that and then I'll pick up with just a few highlights and then guess what, it'll be me and Mr. Watson so we can have our cycle. We'll be, what, are we going to be executed or what? We're ready. So I just want to let you know it'll be about another 10 minutes and then we'll be ready to talk about buses. Thank you. There we go. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Hallman, Finance Director for Douglas County. Um, I've worked for the county for uh, 20 years. I've been Finance Director for 11 of those 20 years. And Madam Chair had asked me to just kind of give you some financial trends on the general fund. Um, on our revenues, expenditures, fund balance, and just kind of give you an idea of where we stand as of or how we feel like we're going to end in 2017 and what ideas and budget um, uh, recommendations were placed in the 2018 budget. Okay. You can go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I, I was thinking this would be bigger on these big screens. Um, this is the 20, uh, 2008 through 2013 revenues and expenditures. Um, our total revenues um, trended uh, up each year um, since 2008 from uh, 72.5 to 88.8 million in 2013. Our expenditures ranged from 78.7 all the way up to, in 2013, to 80.8 million. The next slide, and I apologize. 2014, all the way through uh, 2016, our revenues totaled uh, between 82.5 to 87 million. Our expenditures were around 78.1 uh, million to 86.7 million. When we adopted the 2017 budget, um, as y'all um, may be aware that uh, we adopted it assuming that we were going to have to dip into fund balance, which is our reserves, our savings account, uh, by around $5 million. Okay, um, and that's what was adopted. However, based on um, some revenue projections as well as um, expenditure projections on how we're going to end, we feel like that we're only going to have to use about $2 million of our fund balance. Our adopted budget for 2018 was $89.3 million, and I think the next slides will be something you can be able to read better. Go to the next. Um, this is a history of our fund balance since 2008. Again, like I said, fund balance is just a governmental term for us. It means our savings account, our reserves, uh, rainy day funds you may hear. Um, in 2008, um, we had around 8.3, which was 11%. Our policy is to have a minimum of 10%. Um, and you can see as the years progressed, uh, in 2009, we uh, were 9.1 million of expenditures. In 2014, uh, we ha actually had a rating upgrade for the bond market. So when we go out for bonds, uh, it's kind of like a credit score for the county. We went from a double A minus to a double A. Uh, we were at $18.2 million fund balance, which was 21% of our expenditures. We expect in 2017 to end the year with a minimum of 12.4, which is around 14% of expenditures. The next slide may be a little challenging as well. <laughs> Looks bigger on my screen, on my desk, and I apologize. Um, the Tax Digest, just to kind of give you an idea, um, this just lets you know what the Gross Digest was, what um, the millage rate is, we ranged from a millage rate of t in 2008 of 7.826. 
Um, in 2017, we adopted a millage rate and it was rolled back by almost a half a mil and it was 10.768. Um, the next chart shows that, as you know, we all experienced the recession. The county did too with the digest. Uh, you can see this trend goes downward. The value of a mill back in 2008, meaning that for every mill that is levied, we would get $4.3 million. Um, as the recession hit, we took a large hit in 2010. The digest went down by 13.37%. Continu continued to go down in 11, 12, 13, and 14. 2015 was the first year that we started seeing a little bit of a um, it coming back. Uh, we had a 3.64% increase in the digest. In 2016, we had a 4.64% increase in the digest. In 2017, we had a 10.44% increase in the digest. Of that 10.44%, uh, around 5.5% was due to new growth, and that's what we want to see is the new growth in the digest. When the Board of Commissioners roll back the millage rate, they're rolling back for the reassessment. When you get your reassess, uh, notice, reassessment notices, your increase, uh, your value of your home goes up. Um, the Board of Commissioners have a choice whether they want to roll that back or if they do not, it's considered a tax increase. And um, the Board of Commissioners chose this year as well as in prior years to roll back the millage rate. Um, for the reassessed value, so we do receive additional revenue um, for new growth, and that's what we want to start seeing in the digest is the new growth because that's new tax dollars coming in and helps take the burden off the homeowners. Um, the next slide shows you the 2008 through 2017, the new growth. We just wanted to concentrate on that. As you can see, in 2008, we had 4.62% of new growth in the digest. Um, and then, as you can see, as the chart of a couple of slides uh, before showed the trend going down, in 2010, we actually had a negative growth, if you want to call that, where the digest shrunk and our, we had 1.45 negative growth. 2012, we experienced the same of just over 1% negative growth. 2013, a 1.59% negative growth. And again, 2014 is when we started experiencing some uh, new growth in the digest. Uh, but in 2017 was the biggest new growth we've had um, in the digest, even exceeds the 2008 prior to the recession. We had 5.62% of new growth. And I believe Madam Chair will be talking about the development authority and, and the new businesses coming in and what investment that had on our digest later. Um, the next slide uh, just shows you the what we call budget improvement request. Uh, we wanted to show a trend and show you what a budget improvement request is, is anything above and beyond normal operations each year. We have departments submit a request. That could be vehicles, new employees, uh, new projects or new um, staffing in order to fulfill their needs for their department. And these were the requests that were fulfilled for each year. In 2011, we had almost $3 million. 2012 was kind of a, uh, we were still hit by the recession, and so there was only about $486,000. But roughly around two, uh, two point five to $3 million uh, for 2015. And before, in 2016 was 7.3. However, that was uh, primarily uh, due to the um, budget of the animal shelter as well as the Bleakley building. Um, in 2017, we had $4.8 million. In 2018, this new adopted budget, we have $4.9 million. Okay. And these next slides are going to show you um, the 2017 and 2018 BIRs. And since they're not very low, le le um, cannot read them. Um, the 2018 um, approved, uh, we wanted to be able to show that there, um, that departments, even though the budget was tight and we had some trimming to do, that we felt like we met some of the needs and the critical needs of the, the county, one being the sheriff's department, having that um, extra deputy at Fair Play. Um, they all also got 20 uh, equipped uh, cars for their fleet. Um, there are a lot of items um, 
that were approved. And Madam Chair, because the budget was tight and we were not exactly, we wanted to be conservative on how we were gonna end the year, um, she suggested let's approve what we what is critical, what is necessary, what these departments need, but then let's go back in March after we close our year. Let's look at what how we ended the year. Did we exceed projections? Did we exceed that $12.4 million fund balance? If we did, let's go back and look at the budget improvement requests that were requested but not approved, and let's see what we can do to help these departments. So um, that's what we're gonna be doing probably in late March, early April, depending on when we uh, how we close off the year. Um, and you probably want to go to... If you'll go to slide 19, there you go, thank you. Um, this is showing the first column of the $4.8 million is what the budget improvement requests that were approved in 2017. In 2018, we had just over $5 million. Um, and then what we're going to plan to revisit, uh, not making any promises, but knowing, letting the departments know that when we close the year and we confirm our balances, we have another $2.8 million of needs that are out there that um, are going to be revisited in March. Uh, Madam Chair also asked just to show a history of uh, the COLA and merit uh, that employees get since 1999. Um, during the recession, um, just like most of you when you work, you didn't get an increase maybe that year. Um, and Madam Chair uh, wanted me to show you that in 2018, uh, the, the employees were given a 1% COLA, and then there was a salary study um, that was completed and uh, one of the phase one implementation of that salary study was a two and a half percent um, uh, rate adjustment for employees. So that sums up my presentation and if you have any questions. You okay? <laughs> All right. We are right on target. I just had a few highlights, and then I'm right on. I, I had planned for 7:30 to be the start time for this uh, bus proposed bus discussion. But before we move forward, forward, I just wanted to share a couple of highlights with you. So just, and then we'll move into the main topic of the evening. Should I say the main course? Our, our unemployment in Douglas County is the lowest in 25 years, and this is according to a West Georgia economist, Mr. Uh, Dr. Joel, uh, what is this, Smith, I believe. And our unemployment rate is at a 4.4%, which is pretty good, uh, uh, extraordinary right now. Our population growth here in Douglas County is the highest since 2002. And 2017, yay, my first year in office, was the best year ever in the history of Douglas County for economic development. We garnered $3.3 billion of investments. $3.3 billion is nothing to sneeze at. I just learned to say millions, and now we're talking about billions in Douglas County, so I'm just so happy. Southwire came, Z Galleria, Amazon Fulfillment Center, Medline expanded their businesses, and Switch Database Center, which is the largest investment in Georgia's history, which was $2.5 billion dollars is clearing land right behind Google today and that is going to transform the tax base in Douglas County and we are the envy for every county in Georgia because they can't believe what we landed with that 2.5 billion dollars. Nathan Deal, Governor Nathan Deal and I have had conversations and he said Douglas County is lucky and I said and we are blessed. So please thank God for what he's done for this county. In 2017, we had the highest new growth in the tax, just, uh, tax digest in 10 years. You just saw it at 5.6%. In 
in 2017, and in comparison to the last administration, was 0.9 percent. So that's why we were able to turn and transform that $8.5 million deficit from the, previ from the previous administration because of that new growth. Uh, my, my financial team, my finance director said, Chairman, it may be an anomaly. I said, it's God. I don't know what it was, but we have a 5.6 percent new growth, and that's never been done. Even when we looked at the two point, if we uh, raised it up to 10 years and looked back as far as 10 years, it was, believe I was, it was 4.56 percent. Uh, again, the Miller's rate, we rolled that back from 11.2.67 to 10.66. Uh, we cut your taxes, again, by 4.43 percent last year, or should I say in 2017. The tax commissioner, Greg Baker, and chief tax administrator, Michael Barnhill, garnered over $7 million in delinquent taxes in this county. Roads are under construction all over the county, and your splash pennies are at work. Roads have, now, have not been repaired in some areas in over 30 to 35 years. We have new restaurants and retail stores and street lights and bicycle lanes and sidewalks under construction in the county. We have an Instacart services, which is Publix and Aldi, where you can order your groceries and have your groceries delivered at your doorsteps. And this is in Lithia Springs because of the Publix. Douglasville and Villarica area, and also is it Aldi's or Aldi's? You could have your groceries delivered. My daughter tried it the other night, and she said how sweet it is. <laughs> Hi, is that my daughter back there? Hi, daughter. Thank you. Our pennies are adding up, and so far so good with, splosh, with the splash projects. However, pr proceeds are slightly down because of the online sales. We like to shop online. Sometimes I have to hit my hand and say, no, go to the store. And I like looking around the malls, but we encourage you if you can. But you know what? A lot of these splash dollars are coming from outside. Uh, Alabama, we have a lot of people vi visiting. We have a lot of travelers, so they are helping. So the splash is not only for Douglas County citizens. We have the contributions from the outsiders, such as visitors. And then uh, Alabama has taken a lot of the splash in helping us out, particularly around the holiday seasons. And uh, Mr. Good talked about the percentages for the, the splashed. Also, we have a new state-of-the-art animal shelter that opened in April of 2017. The Bleakley Building project is on uh, task for the fleet services, and also Bleakley Building would be the new tax commissioner and the tax assessor's office. They're really excited about that. We have a new tax kiosk in the courthouse. We encourage you to use it. If you're like me, sometimes you have somewhere else to go and you don't need to stand in line, particularly on your birthday. You can get your tags early and keep moving. Dog River Trails opened in May or June timeframe of last year, 2017. The Sweet Water Master Plan approved by the Board of Commissioners and the Planning and Zoning Team had been on the books for over 10 years. That's taken care of now. And we, last year in grant funding, we received over $3 million in grant subsidies just to subsidize a lot of our programs because I made it very clear during my campaign uh, run that I that I believed in grants because grants subsidize some of the pressure and take the pressure off our taxpayers. And we advanced from bronze to silver status in nationally rec recognized green community programs. We joined Keep America Beautiful affiliation, which now we have a Keep Douglas County Beautiful program. Our external affairs director is working on uh, getting that program off the ground, we had to become certified. I didn't realize there was so much rigor involved, but we are certified now. In uh, October, um, Douglas County was recognized on the floor of the U.S. Co congressional session uh, by, in Washington, D.C., by con uh, D uh, Congressman David Scott for our efforts in recognizing October as Behavioral Health Month. Our general fund is, general fund is remarkably healthy after battling an $8.5 million deficit from the previous administration. Despite it all, I presented a balanced 2018 budget to the commissioners, Board of Commissioners. We did not cut your services. We added the same or even more for budget improvement request in comparison to last year. And I will visit all the BRRs again, budget improvement request in March. Our fund balance, as our finance director said, is $12.4 million. And that is just the highlight. I wanted you to just have a highlight of what's going on in Douglas County. And last but not least, we have myself and my 
infamous transportation director, Mr. Gary Watson, before I would start, and you could, I'll have you come up and we'll chat in just a second. Uh, is Director Stanley, did, did everybody get a copy of all the reports? And also, I would like to, do we have the PowerPoints for this particular one? I, uh, any more handouts, uh, Director of External? She said, if you raise your hand, we'll give you one. Okay. I think we're about six minutes behind. This proposed bus system. Thank you all for all of your emails and conversations about this proposed bus system. I appreciate your confidence and patience for allowing me to do my due diligence in researching your concerns. The planning initiatives for this intermodal bus system originated in 2015, 2015. And I will refresh your memory in just a few minutes by showing a quick video with some slides. And it'll be about a five minute snippet, just so you see how this thing happened. And for those of you who are unclear, this intermodal bus system was approved and voted in with the 5.0 unanimous vote under the previous administration. With that being said, I am managing the cards I have been dealt. It is my understanding the original plan was to fund this bus system out of the general fund. But in the last month, I have been bombarded by emails and uh, oppo stating, uh, people stating opposition to, well, opposition for this system, and some, and most importantly, I think, those ones that said they're in favor for this pro proposed system. But I took the time to respond to each one of your, your, your emails and your calls as we take this matter to, uh, and put it into action. Perhaps, and I'm just saying this for me, and I can't speak for you. We were all asleep at the wheel in 2015, or did our commissioner, commissioners proactively communicate this proposed bus system to the system, to their, to their citizens in their prospective districts, and I'll have that conversation offline with them. They're not here tonight. I, had, I even had several citizens admit, quote, unquote, this is what a citizen said to me. He said, this is what we get when we don't keep a check on what's going on in county government. I said, yes, sir, I understand. He said, not to mention where were our voices when we had three commissioners vote in 2013 and raise your taxes to 23.8%. Again, we will sleep at the wheel. But that when your budget is in trouble, we're not gonna worry about that. We just have to look ahead. So what I did as a leader, I said we cannot put this budget on the backs of our taxpayers. Every day I come to the office, I'm swinging for I call it 144, so 144,000 citizens. When this budget was in trouble with, with an $8.5 million shortfall, I, all the wind was taken out of my cell when my finance director said, Chairman, we don't have anywhere to go. We've emptied every drawer. We've uh, got all the money out the mattress. Uh, we can't go anywhere. She said, we're in trouble. I said, uh-oh, we can't. I said, we can't put this on the backs of our citizens because the what most counties would do when you have a shortfall like that, they raise that millage rate, your taxes go up, and then you give us a 12 million and we get out the back door and everybody's happy. But I wanted some critical thinking to, be, to take place because I've been in management and leadership for 32 years of my 40 year career, and that is, uh, I've worked in healthcare and we understand how to work a budget and expenses. So we made it happen. And then also, uh, we, someone talked about us not being transparent. I said, guys, the place is open. We open for business here. We have our work sessions available for you. You can look at those work sessions. We have a board of commissioner meetings are open, but particularly your work sessions. That's why we have a big house tonight. I appreciate that because you can see what's going on. You can see when I cough, sneeze, it's right there. And I wanted to open it up to the citizens. Um, I've had several citizens demand documentation to, to validate the citizens' engagement and tell us 
how did this occur in 2015 while we were asleep? I said, well, let me do my homework. I had to go through some spider webs and cobwebs, cobwebs, some boxes, because 2015 it was almost three years ago. But we were able to find it. I know your comments about this baby belongs to me now. It was a true statement. When I discovered this proposed bus system was going to be placed or potentially placed on the backs of our taxpayer citizens, tax-paying citizens, I immediately sought a federal grant to take the pressure off the taxpayers. And I know so many people don't agree with that, but I said, how could we put this on the backs of our taxpayers? I said, that is not gonna fly on my watch. So a federal grant is just not easy to get. You have to compete. And what we have to become accustomed to in Douglas County is, number one, there's no room for second place. I said that very clearly when I entered office. I said, it's just no room for second place because we will be the standard of excellence in the state of Georgia. I had a conversation with the governor's cabinet recently. They called me. I didn't call them. They said, we are moving toward regional transportation. And Douglas County is not exempt. So that's a bigger picture. But I'm just, I'm just we're going to deal with this little bitty baby right here, the little 12-seat passenger bus uh, that has 12 seats on it that has uh, two wheelchair access. Somebody said, Chairman, you could stop this. I said, guess what? I don't have veto power. That's not good, is it? So when you don't have veto power, you think outside the box. And the pressure was, I think, I, I feel honored that you're here tonight because the most painful piece would be to tell you that I was trying to put something on your back. We are trying to look at something creatively. creatively. I asked my um, transportation director, I said, you know what? What about that match, that $400,000 match everybody's talking about? That means we got to go in the general fund. He said, Chairman, the ridership will offset that. I said, OK, the, the, we, the ridership. And then if we do have to take some out of the, the general fund, it won't impact your taxes, but the ridership, which will, I don't know the pricing, and he'll talk about that. And we haven't set the fees for those. Uh, somebody talked about MARTA. MARTA would, first of all, I made it clear in August that um, Marta is not an option in Douglas County. It's just not an option. We're not ready for it. Uh, I'm not from Georgia, but I've been adopted by Georgia, and I realize in Douglas County the word Marta is not a good word. So I immediately made it clear to all the citizens. We had it in the newspaper that I, and I believe the Sentinel had, and I have to go back and find the article, but it says that Chairman Jones says Marta is not an option. And uh, believe it or not, I believe Marta would be insulted if I asked them to come get some 12 passenger seat buses when they have 60 seats. So I didn't want us to even, I wouldn't even embarrass myself by even trying to approach Marta. So that is not part of the deal. And we're going to talk about those routes. I know people are ex a little excited about the routes, and I'll tell you why. I'm sorry, I'm a, my mouth is a little dry. Um, if this grant is approved, it's a three-year grant. Somebody said, then what? Well, first of all, I just told you you have $2.5 billion that's coming down the pike, and everybody in Georgia and in this United States, these United States are looking at us right now because we're going to have service that's coming all the way from Virginia all the way to M Miami. You'll have all types of service, and that real property will net some, it's going to hit that tax digest and make that thing just so excitable until I have senators in Georgia here said, why couldn't they have come to our county? So we're going to have a little fluff, but if that doesn't work, then what? We apply for another grant. I realize you can't apply, apply for a second CMAC grant. That's a no-no. But there are other grants out there. If that doesn't work, then what? Worst case scenario, those are little tiny shuttle buses. Um, we have a fleet of buses now that we use for our seniors that are smaller than those little tiny buses. Guess what, guys? We'll just put them in the fleet and say, done deal. But I, I mean, the, the deal is done. But what I did make very clear to the citizens, I said, if this grant, because I don't have veto power, I feel like a coach that's coaching the Alabama, was that Alabama and the Georgia Bulldogs game? And I'm the little tool right now, and I got to throw a Hail Mary or something to keep the pressure off my citizens. So what I said, well, if we don't get the grant, and I looked at the, the transportation chairman, who's Commissioner Robinson, 
I said, if we don't get this grant, we don't go forward now until we get enough fluff to carry us over the river because this will not go on the backs of our taxpayers. So I made that very clear. And so that's where we are now. And um, almost no recourse at 2015 because I said, man, I'll be honest with you. I, I was asleep at the wheel. I was at Children's Healthcare Atlanta in surgery operating on somebody's heart. So with that being said, I want to look at what we have. Can just keep, okay. Thank you. You want to keep going? Okay. This is 2015. I just pulled, and we're not going to spend a little time. Is this, do you have the video, Rick? Did we just play the video? You want the video? No, we'll just roll through the slides first. Just roll through just a few slides so they can see, and we won't take up too much because I want everybody to be able to ask questions. You all have a document with you. <laughs> Tiffany passed out this document. If you, um, you have it, it's the progress report. This pro everybody have their progress report. I think we did. We tried to give out as many as possible. Do you see where they had accomplishments to date? So it shows where there was a project kickoff in April of 2018. Do you see all the things under your accomplishments? I won't stand here and read it, but do you see what happened in 2018? There was a, 2015, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm back in 2018. The project kickoff, let me tell you, let me just read those for folks that, this is what happened, because I had to find out too. This is a document that we have. This will be on the website as well. This should go on the website. I talked to my communications director and said, we need this information because we had concerned citizens looking for this. The project kickoff happened April 2015. Uh, commission, and they talked about the, accomplish, the accomplishments to date. The commission district two was held April 2015 but I don't see any other record where the other commissioners were notified, so I need to talk to those commissioners to see if they did their due diligence. Agency meetings with the Senior Services and Accountability Court was May 2015. We launched a project survey paper online and they received 1,030 responses to date, and that was in April 2015 as they were given this report. And an, an analysis and summary underway they created an updated project contact data database with names, contact information from pop-up events and survey responses. They set up pop-up tables at two community in, uh, events and summarized public input. We had a senior picnic May 2015, and this information was being disseminated. Uh, Hydrangea Festival, June 2015, and there was a map of transportation services within Douglas County services offered by adjacent counties. So this is... And then you just, I won't sit here and take the time to read all this, but take, just look at this. You could put this in your uh, repertoire, and then also we will also take the time and put it on the website. Uh, the, those are the, that's, that's it. You can yeah. just keep going. I, I believe, everybody okay with this, or do you need me to read this thing verbatim? You good? Okay. You good? Okay. Okay, but I'm just saying, do you have your, this is the same as this. Do you have it? Okay. We will keep going. Keep going. Where's the PowerPoint, the PowerPoint presentation? Do you have it? Kickoff meeting. Gary's? Gary's. No, which, which one? The one from the kickoff meeting. Yeah. From 2015. Okay, and then the, I have the PowerPoint from the kickoff meeting to 2015, from 2015, so you all can see what happened when we weren't here in the room. And then you say you'll go with the snippet of the, of the video because yeah. I know they're so anxious there. Okay. As you see, this is just the information that, this is a slide, but I have a video to show that will probably do this a little more justice. Can, can we show the video? And yeah, that's a bit. Okay. And then we'll just show about five minutes of it and so you could pick up on the gist of what I'm having to deal with when I go back three years looking for something. I'm like, wow. So what I've been doing is I try to do my due diligence in respect of the 144,000 citizens and pay homage to you because you deserve respect. I just, I'm just not sure what happened, how this information, uh, did, and again, I will have discussions with your district commissioners to, to determine because they all were elected during this period to determine why did this information not get disseminated? Except District 2, I believe, had one town hall meeting. But the meet, again, this was voted on.
Just keep, because that thing keeps going. Okay. Here we go. Um, we have for quite some time now been looking at how to approach our transport, tra transportation demand management issues in Douglas County. We have a lot of uh, population segment that uh, does not have access to transportation. Uh, we have a large segment of the population that is elderly. Uh, at the same time, a lot of, of those of us uh, who live in the community are aging ourselves, and we're going to be more dependent uh, on opportunities for other transportation choices as our abilities to drive diminish and as we uh, age in place here in this community. So uh, this is something that's really important across the board. It affects the entire population of the county in some form or fashion. Uh, and as Commissioner Robinson said, you know, there's different character throughout the county in the different districts. So this effort's gonna be directed toward blending different transportation choices together into initiatives and programs uh, that will serve the entire county and serve the people who uh, need uh, improved transportation mobility. When we originally started out, this was programmed as a transit feasibility study. And we, along with uh, our partners at the Atlanta Regional Commission, started to look differently at how we define uh, transportation choices. specific mode and so what we want to do through this study is look at the, the uh, service efficiencies of the programs that we have today that we operate today that are very very successful but we want to look at where we can incorporate technology to make those service service efficiencies improve we also want to look at technology to help us initiate new services that might be acceptable to the entire Douglas County community at the same time, um, we want to look at new programs and new, new initiatives that can be blended with what we're already offering to give people transportation, transportation choices. At the end of the day, it's really about choices and how we make our mobility decisions. Commuting has changed a lot within the last five years. People don't commute the same way they did five years ago. Communications technology has helped us to, to change the way we commute. We expect that's going to continue to, to help change the way we commute. Uh, some people have a need to commute to their employment destinations twice a week. Some people five days a week. Some people midday. Some people mid-afternoon. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, dynamic shifting, I would say, that, that we see occurring as transportation professionals based on the changes in technology that we're, we're experiencing. So we want to look at those things and see how we can incorporate those into our program and new service efficiencies where we have programs that are already successful. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is we have no intention of getting in the business of running a transit system throughout the Atlanta region. We are very, very strong advocates for regional trans transportation plan, regional transit plan. We participated in it and been a part of the development of that plan. There are some things that are slated for Douglas County, and we're going to push for those things as, as funding becomes available and keep those a priority in the regional plan. What we feel like we need to be about is taking care of the mobility needs of the citizens of this county connecting them to the areas that they need to get, get connected to through the systems that we have available to us now. Uh, we've envisioned in our 2008 uh, comprehensive transportation plan uh, a branding uh, concept that would uh, define our program as Douglas Connect, uh, and it would encompass all the various types of multimodal programs that we want to offer, whether it be ride share, whether it be main pool programs, whether it be an intra-county uh, shuttle system or some type of flex system, 
uh, that moves and circulates people around the county. Uh, but we want to build our circulation and feeder systems that will connect people to the destinations in the region that they need to get to through the system that turns out to be the regional transit system. At the same time, we want to build a vibrant uh, Douglas County that also increases jobs, economic development, growth, uh, so that we can sustain an inter-county system for people to be able to, to move around the county and to not have to travel 45 miles every morning to a job throughout the region. That's something that we want to build for the future. So this study is about the here and now, but it's also about the future. Um, it is um, very important. It's different. Uh, it's not like any other study that I know of, and I think Jamie would say the same thing. Nobody's approached it quite the way we have uh, with, uh, with the type of proposal that we put out. So with that said, uh, Ms. Jamie Cochran, uh, who is a senior planner uh, with... I think you get the, the gist, and this is also on the website for our citizens' rights, so they, if you wanted to continue. With no further ado, I have uh, our Director of Transportation, Mr. Gary Watson. Please come forward. And you have a PowerPoint too, right? Something. I'm, I'm not going to use it. We're going to cut right to the chase here in just a minute. Okay. Hey, everybody. It's good to see y'all uh, tonight. Uh, this is a really good turnout. And, and I know that a community is a better place when its citizens are involved in its local government. And thank y'all for doing that uh, tonight. Uh, one thing that y'all might not know about me is that before I came to work for the county in 1986, I spent 20 years in the newspaper business. I was editor of the Douglas County Sentinel from 1973 to 1987. And Liz Marino, who's with the Sentinel now, she and I have known each other for more years than we really care to uh, to talk about, but but Liz is a really, uh, really good lady and a really good reporter, and I value her friendship very much. A uh, couple of things that I want to, to start off with tonight uh, to let y'all know about. Number one is that I work at the pleasure of the Board of Commissioners. I do what they tell me to do, and right now, my charge is to try to implement fixed route bus service, provided we get $4.8 million in a federal congestion mitigation air quality grant. That's the key to the whole thing right now. We've been pre-approved for this grant. We're waiting for the final approval, which should, should come in May or June. And if, uh, if we get that grant and if the commissioners are so inclined, that's when we will go full speed ahead with the bus service. Now, another thing I want to tell y'all, my door, my office is open to you all the time. Call me, send me an email, or like the, the guy on the TV ads for Stone Mountain Toyota says, Come by and see me, and we'll have a cup of coffee and sit down and talk. <laughs> I, I would love to have the chance uh, to talk to all y'all about it. Um, I'll tell you straight, I'll answer your questions. Now, my answer, my answer may not be what you want to hear. It may not be what you think is the right answer, but I'll give you an honest answer, provided it's not a question that I think it would be more appropriate for the Board of Commissioners to answer. And if that's the case, I'll tell you that. Um, I've got a PowerPoint uh, that shows the four routes that we're proposing, and TJ, if you can put those up on the screen. Uh, we'll talk about the routes some, um, but uh, I do want to just quickly go ahead 
and, and cut to the chase. And by that, I mean, uh, I want to field your questions. And, and, and I'll try to answer them as truthfully and honestly as I can. Like I said, it may not be what you want to hear, but I'll give you an answer. Okay, and Mr. Martin says one question per person. We go down a portion of Timber Ridge to try to ter serve the technical school in those doctor's offices that are right there. I understand that, but it still creates more traffic on the road that the county or city is trying to divert in the first place. That's, That's that we looked at a lot of different scenarios and to serve those particular locations. That that was the best that we felt like would would work. Okay. Also, there's a lot of foot traffic already on that road. People run about 90 down that trailer, and this will create more foot traffic, which could be dangerous for the foot traffic, because there's not a sidewalk. Huh? There's no sidewalk. Those were questions that I'll, I'll direct to Chair, uh, Chairman Jones. Okay. The first one was, say your first question again, thank you, if you don't mind. It is my understanding that a feasibility and a sustainability uh, study has been done in advance with around that 2015, 2016 timeframe. So the, the study has already been done. We have statistics. However, that does not preclude the fact that I may say we can do another one. But at this point, we are moving down the pathway. Sustainability, I know I've talked about that. I said the sustain, sustainability is a three-year grant. From there, uh, like most forward-thinking counties, you apply for another one. If you don't get that, then we go with another plan, which I just talked about, your $2.5 billion that someone just dropped in our lap. So that's an opportunity that that tax digest is going to be extremely healthy. But if it does not work, it's uh, four, I believe, how many buses? Four to nine? How many? Four buses with 12 seats, uh, two wheelchair passengers, nothing compared to that we can absorb into our existing fleet. I know there were some questions about the Cobb County system failing. Yeah, but they have large buses there. Those buses are large, and uh, Mike Boyce, who's the chairman of uh, Cobb County, is a very good friend of mine, and he said, Chairman, if we had a chance to do it all over again, we would uh, follow the poster child, which is Douglas County, for implementing small intermodal systems first before going so large, because right now they're struggling over there. So he has buses riding around that are empty. So. That, that's, that's what we have in terms of that study. I, I do work for the city of Powder Springs, and I was recently in a transportation meeting with a flex bus system, which is a smaller bus system that does, um, it's, a little, it's a little bit different than the proposed project here. 
Right. Well, my second part to that question is, do you anticipate mm -hmm. that there will be any kind of impact on the city's uh, service delivery strategy uh, with this bus system? No, there's no anticipation for the impact, an impact for the service delivery uh, st strategy. And also, I know we had conversations about you working in Powder Springs. Thank you for that. Spoke with Mike Boyce as well about his his. Uh, Right now, I, I think we don't want to be compared with Cobb County because they're struggling. They, they have a $30 million shortfall. They couldn't turn it around. We turned it around. I'm pretty braggadocious and very confident, confident right now. So I'm just, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying, um, we're going forward if we get the grant. And if it falls, it's, no, it's not going to be any skin loss in the game. We can put the four, five, or nine buses back in the fleet. But if you do nothing, in a state that has already, I received calls that said we are moving forward with regional transportation and Douglas County is not exempt. Our president of the United States said America is open for, for business and Douglas County is open for business. So that's the, the route we're going. We have to take a step. Uh, again, like I said, I don't have veto power and I'm just trying to manage these cars that I've been dealt. I certainly wish I had a crystal ball before me, but I just got to just go on faith like I've done with so many other things, and I just, we just, we'll try it. And if it does not work, we just have to flush it and put those little mini buses, which you all, if you, I'm laughing because they're, they look like little vans. When I saw the buses, I, were, I was really disappointed. I said, this is a bus? So it's really a, ba a van. You, you have, we have buses now, which is your Greta. Greta has been here since 2003. 65 seat passenger buses on the, on the ground in, in Douglas County go into the heart of Atlanta, not to just homes and uh, just a pathway because you hear the word Marta and turn around. They go all the way into the heart of Atlanta. And when the citizens or whoever ride those buses in, they don't have to show an ID to get back on, the, on those buses. So they're probably bringing everybody in now. See, and I know we worried about 12 buses and you got 65 seats that's going to Atlanta every day in the heart of Atlanta. So that's what I'm saying. I think we are just, I, I, I try not to be short-sighted. I, I, I try to think outside the box. And when I looked at some comparison data, I said, wow, how long we've had these Greta buses? 2003, big 60 passenger buses pull out every day, full. And I know some lady personally that said, you know what, I just needed a ride to, uh, to Douglasville the other day, and she didn't live in Douglasville. She lived in Paulden County, but she rode here. So if she was coming to steal a TV or a couch or whatever, I don't think she could do it. That's what I'm telling you. So it's, it, 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 we got the big buses already here. So any other questions, Stephanie? Yes, thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you.
start service with two routes, a simple circular route and a north side route. The buses will accommodate your driver, 12 ambulatory, ambulatory passengers, and two wheelchair passengers. Future expansions will most likely include a route serving Fort Worth and Riverside Parkway. The application for the CMAC grant was signed into resolution by the Board of Commissioners on May 15, 2017 and submitted to ARC Group. Submitted to ARC requested a small bus system with two routes, four buses,
Okay, let, let, let me address a, a few things the, of your comments. First of all, this, this past fall, we did take the four new routes to the Transportation Committee. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we, to we totally, we, we showed the Transportation Committee those routes. We, they were vetted during that committee meeting, and that committee meeting was filmed for the public to see. Also, we did take those four routes to the Board of Commissioners shortly, shortly after that on a, on a work session on a Monday. Which, which was again filmed for the, for the public to see. Uh, those four routes were presented to the Board of Commissioners and while they may not have taken a, an official vote on those routes, they were aware that those were the routes that we were going to need to submit to the Atlanta Regional Commission for our CMAC application uh, to have a chance to be approved. Now going back to the very beginning, you, met, you mentioned the word morphed. Absolutely, these routes have morphed a number of times. And we did start out with two routes. Uh, we wanted to start small. Uh, we, we wanted to start out with something that, that we were comfortable with. So we started out with two routes that would basically serve uh, the city of Douglas. And as we were working on those routes, ARC staff came out and sat down with us and helped us plot those two routes. And they said, okay, this is good enough for you to submit with your initial CMAC application, which we did. All right, so we go on a little while, <clears throat> and those same ARC staffers come back and say to us, well, now these routes, they're not modeling very well for the CMAC application. We need to look at them again. So we sat down again with ARC staff, and this time they went from two routes to one route that would serve the city of Douglasville. So we, we took that, that back to them. Well, a little later on, ARC came back to us and said, we don't think this one's gonna work. We need, we need to take another pass at it. So we went from one route to three routes, two Douglasville routes and, and a Thornton Road route. Well, <clears throat> About that time, for a very short time, that's when MARTA got involved. And they took a look at it and they actually proposed five routes for us. And we, myself, and Mr. Valentin especially said, that's, n that's not gonna work. So we had, had that conversation and Chairman, Madam Chairman made it very clear that MARTA wasn't going to be involved in that process. So we had to totally abandoned that. Well, after that, we got called into Atlanta, Mr. Valentin and I did, to have a, a meeting with a higher level of ARC officials, and, and they said, okay, we played around with this long enough. It's time that we really firm up your routes and your proposed budget. So we realized at that point it, that we needed some outside help, and that's what we brought when we brought in the kinetics Firm. And this is what they do for a living. They work with MARTA, they work with Cobb County, they work with Grumet County, they work with transit agencies throughout the, the southeast. So they spent about five, five weeks, six weeks working with us. Uh, and what they came up with were the, the, the four routes that we see now. Two of those serve the city of Douglasville, uh, one serves the Thornton Road, Riverside, Six Flags drive area and then one is an express route that goes from Douglasville to the H.E. Holmes Marta station. So that's what Kinetics um, chose for us. That's what we vetted through the Transportation Committee and the Board, Board of Commissioners. We submitted those to the ARC as our final routes for the CMAC application and that's what's resulted in us getting pre-approval for the CMAC application. And that's pretty much a whole history of, of the morphing of the routes. I know I'm not supposed to ask any more questions, but I think that you need to, or I would, look at it from the taxpayer's perspective. Um, you know, I've got the documentation. I've looked through the documents. Um, and it reads a little bit differently. And I thought my understanding is that everything had to be uh, passed through to the entire board for approval to move forward. 
Well, I'll, like I said, we did submit the routes to the Board of Commissioners, and if Madam Chair won't, won't, won't. Rename that meeting, and if so, we have access to it through their system. If, do you have? Okay. I'm sure that the clerk would have yeah. meetings. Uh, yes. Lisa, yes. Lisa Watson would have that information. Is it? Yeah. Tell her that. Yeah. Signed off work. Excuse me. Signed off working minutes. Minutes are available on the website. Um, if you know, yeah. I can help you. Okay. Yep. Sure. Okay. Yes, 
one of the things that uh, that uh, I wanted to clarify a little bit is that the buses, they're really large vans, and they are not the biggest uh, uh, cause of potholes, or they do not cause the kind of damage to the road structure that you think. In fact, the highest, the most impactful vehicle on the road infrastructure is your trash trucks. And you're not going to get those off of the roads uh, anytime soon. So in comparison to a trash truck that comes down those roads on a regular basis, this doesn't even make a dent. So in terms of damage to the roads, certainly all of those routes would have to be monitored for impact, but it is not likely to be the buses or the large vans that would cause the impact. Frankly, construction equipment, delivery trucks, but more so than anything else, your garbage truck is what causes the damage. There's no question that, that uh, there's a lot of trucks in the area and they do cause a lot more damage to a road than a large van. But as much as we have signage that indicates this is not a route for trucks, they not only do they do it, they are allowed to do it by law if they have business in that area. Now. Obviously, I'm sure you have seen plenty of them that, that don't. Yeah. And, and that becomes an enforcement issue. But, but uh, again, if a truck has a delivery to make in an area, if they operate out of that area, then by law, they cannot be banned from those roads. So I hear you. Uh, it, is, it is a problem. And again, we will certainly monitor all of the infrastructure along those routes and make, make repairs as needed. But, uh, but again, we do not anticipate in all honesty that it is uh, the large vans that are going to be causing the damage. It's just the normal use from the heavy trucks. Well, I, I can't speak to the infrastructure. Again, Mr. Valentin can address that as far as whether or not Douglas County is, is ready for a bus system. The, the comprehensive transportation services study that we did back in 2015 indicates that we are. Uh, the only well, way you will know for sure is to give it a try. several concerns um, about this and my first question is really to clarify an issue that that I have was there a feasibility study done before this was in, before this was voted on I don't, I don't want to confuse the term 
Was there a feasibility study done? The, only, the study that was done was the transportation services study. Okay. Can you tell me what the difference, because with the city, it seems like we've got we've to have a feasibility study before, you know, before we do anything. What is the difference between a feasibility study and the study that you're well in this case I don't think there there was any study any difference in a services study and a feasibility study because basically this study told us that it looked like we were ready to implement uh, uh, a fixed route bus service on a small scale so there's a needs assessment study not a feasibility study correct I, th I think it's semantics semantics yes Okay. So, okay. Okay. I understand that. And my, my other concern was being on the city council. The council had no formal recognition or information about this system before we got one phone call giving us one day's notice to support the uh, CMAC grant that y'all applied for last year. In the board minutes that I have read going back to 2015, the chairman at that time announced in, in those minutes that this would be a process that, that was done by the county but also instituted by the city. Now based upon that, there was a service delivery strategy. That, does anybody know what service delivery strategy is? Okay. Just real quick is basically how the county and the city work out delivery of services. So I was surprised when I went back and basically the city had allowed the county to do all public transportation. Now that, that service delivery strategy runs out. And being a small city with a $26 million budget, I do not want to have to face making the decision to to do away with these routes in a few years because the burden gets shifted back to the city. And it's an important part right now because I've asked our lawyers to look into it to see if there is a way that the city could enjoin the county from usurping our roads in the city. And we cannot because we agreed in the service delivery strategy that we have given y'all the ability, the ability to do that. Now, I'm very concerned about learning of some new dates here today that may preclude our, uh, our lawyers' uh, position on that. But it, it concerns me very much so that there was not a feasibility study. Uh, I hate to disagree with you, but I think that there's a big difference between a feasibility study and a whatever the study it is you call it. Um, and then also, there was a question about service delivery strategy. This is likely to be a huge service delivery strategy issue in the upcoming years. Um, and then finally, whatever study that was done to begin with didn't talk to anybody in my ward that I'm aware of, and I've talked to a lot of people about this. <laughs> we don't vote for the folks down at the ARC we don't vote for the people who determine these CMAT grants. We vote for the people who are making the decisions here. Nobody asked me, and I'm on the city council. I'm actually the intergovernmental uh, chairman to the city council. And no one from the county commission ever talked to me about the needs, wants, or desires of my ward that according to at least the first two routes, was the most affected by this decision. I don't believe that's good government. Uh, hey. Hello, Gary. Hey. Can you hear me, Gary? I can. We can hear you. We can hear you. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Good to see you, Gary. You too. Appreciate the heat you're taking, partner. <laughs> well, like I said, after 20 years in the newspaper business and 20 uh, years in government, I kind of developed a tough skin. 
<laughs> it's, it's still more fun when everybody agrees on something, but that's usually not what happens. I can amen that. Uh, I'm Edwin Daniel. I'm from the 4th District uh, in the county, not the city ward. Uh, I had a bunch of questions that was running through my mind, and I was trying to decide which one was most important. Miss Heather did a good job. She covered a lot of the information that I had question of which was most important. It left me down to the point where mine's going to be short and simple. This thing started off in my thoughts 2016. I was asleep in 2015, I guess, because I missed that. But I've been aware since 2016 that this was a bus route. I was aware in 2016 that the bus route was for uh, transporting senior citizens that needed the help and handicapped persons that needed the help. It looks to me like now with these four routes that this has morphed into, that we are competing with our girder buses and possibly some other systems. I can't see the need for the competition, but my question is, the original approval was for around $500,000 to get started, $100,000 a year maintenance. And now uh, we're looking at $3.4 million a year to operate this thing according to the information y'all have passed out. We're also, as of tonight I learned, looking at $2.8 million in additional needs above the eight, 2018 budget. My question to all of you is how in the world are we going to fund this new thing that's nowhere near what it started off, even with the federal grants, without any kind of tax burden on the taxpayers? Okay. Well, <clears throat> the, the budget that, is, that we're looking at right now uh, to operate the bus service with is a little under $2 million a year. For the first three years that we have the CMET grant, the federal grant will give us $1.6 million, and we anticipate that the, the rider fares would be around $400,000 uh, a year. So for the first three years, there would be very little um, county money out of the general fund to operate it with. Follow-up, is this a three-year program and then it dies? Well, again, that's, that's a decision that the Board of Commissioners will have to make. I just can't fathom any way that this little bitty system that started out that was supposed to help our seniors, and I was totally in favor of that, I can still drive today. Let, I'm, let, I'm let, let me address that. that. And I'm not sure how that got started, but, but that's, that's a misconception. The, the bus service itself, it, it's never been designed just strictly for seniors and disabled individuals. It's, it's, it's for all citizens of Douglas County. And, and I, I, you know, I have to go back and look at, at the study and go all, but and I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand that. Yeah. It's but, even in your handout, Gary. Well. It's right here. That, I, I, I didn't do that one. So. But, I, you know. Re regard regardless, regardless of what that handout says, and, and I've, I've been on this project from the very beginning, it, the bus service was never intended strictly for seniors and disabled individuals. We, we already have the, the voucher program to address some of their needs. And of course, some of them will be able to, to utilize the bus service as well. well it if you go back and look at the own, your own county records, maybe not in your desk, but what's been released from the county several times because of this figure here and this just substantiated what my notes say from 2016. This thing originally was to help the seniors and the handicapped, and nobody in this room is opposed to that, I'll guarantee you. Right? We all want to help our grandparents, our parents and ourselves shortly, uh, so we're not opposed to that. But we need to really look at this thing. I don't see how the ARC has got such control over our county. That's, that's not right. And I've 
Absolutely. Thank you very much for the program tonight and having everybody out here, Madam Chairman. Hi, uh, Julie Camp again. Uh, I want to revisit the Cobb County discussion because it is pertinent to Douglas County. They are our neighbor to the north of us, mm -hmm. and our system will kind of somewhat mirror what they do. Their system served more people. It went to more places. It did a better job than, than what we have. Ours mostly just goes around, uh, you know, a little bit here in the city and up down Thornton Road and into, you know, the bus station in Atlanta. So how do we get to the buses? You know, how are we going to get there? But that's not a question. That's a statement. Uh, what I want to say, though, Cobb County has a median income that kicks our tail. We don't have the money they do. They have a medium household price, the sales price, much higher than Douglas County. You know, our tax base cannot cover what Cobb <coughs> County can. And when the CMAC grant runs out, we're on the hook, us. Everybody in this room will be paying. Whether you rent or own your home, you will be paying. And that's when the buses start breaking down. You know, after three years, they've been on the road every day, all day long, tearing up the roads. And yes, they will tear up the roads. They're heavy vehicles. Uh, and the little bus buildings that we have, we used to wait for the bus. The weather will damage those. And we will have a lot more expenses that they're not putting into this proposition. They are not putting in the cost that we are paying for yet another entitlement program. And I call it an entitlement program because the people riding it, they're not going to be paying for it. They're going to pay a minimal amount every day when they ride the bus, and that's fine. But we, all of us, are paying the rest. And I just want to say I have a First Amendment right to ask questions and to speak. Thank you. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Sabina, it's right. Yeah, it's working. Gary, are you going to speak to that first, to what Julie said? Or? No. I, no. 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 There's, no. There was just a comment okay. on them. She just made, right. com made comments. Go ahead and ask your question. All right. So, throughout this process, there's been one commissioner who's been problematic, and that's Kelly Robinson. He's repeatedly and deliberately deceived the, the citizens of Douglas County, its staff, and the Board of Commissioners. Commissioner Robinson is, has proven himself to be untrustworthy by plotting and scheming to circumvent transparency. On January 13th, he replied to me in a post, Facebook post saying, pay attention or get someone down to the courthouse who can play at this pace and speed. I welcome a higher level of consciousness, fellow members, so please move on. This game moves fast, and if you don't, you don't have to cheat, just outperform. Well, his arrogance precedes him. Commissioner Robinson is totally unaffected by any tax increase that will be recommended by his finance committee later in the year due to the fact that he owns no property here, has no skin in the game thus paying no property taxes in this county. <laughs> Commissioner Robinson has been given the chairmanship of the crucial transportation and finance committees for Douglas County, quite the platform to pull the strings for this bus system. This evening, I respectfully request that he be removed immediately from both of these committees. <laughs> He has abused the faith and trust of the citizens of Douglas County. We demand transparency and honesty in our representatives. Remember, you work for the people. Okay. I've lived in Douglas County for about 25 years, and I've been a homeowner for about 14 years, and
and um, I'm actually really excited about um, the proposal for this bus system. I think it would really um, be a great thing for my family personally. I have a college student who goes to Georgia State. Um, we want to. We love Douglas County. We want to stay here, and we think it's great. She's going to get an education, and she's going to bring the education right back here to Douglas County. I also think it's great for the environment, and we will be happy to participate in something that is actually better for our environment, get the cars off the road, help our senior citizens and our more disadvantaged uh, citizens in our county. So um, we actually really support this. And my, my question is more logistical. Um, someone mentioned <coughs> before that um, there would actually be more flexibility in uh, you know, times that the bus routes would run and uh, back and forth. And I, I wanted to know if you could just address really quickly um, how that might benefit someone who has a, you know, maybe like a college student who's trying to get downtown. Sure. The, the schedule that we're looking at right now for the buses is from 6 a.m. in the morning until 8 p.m. Uh, in the evening. They would, be, they would be running every 30 minutes. And 40 minutes. Okay. Sure. The schedule that we're working on right now looking at is the buses would run Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. in the morning to 8 p.m., uh, we'd have a limited Saturday service lot from 7 to 3 in the afternoon. The buses would run every 30 minutes. This would allow an individual who needs to, to get into Atlanta to uh, take the H.E. Holmes bus uh, in and kept, make a MARTA connection to Georgia State, Georgia Tech, wherever he needed to go. Thank you. Let me say something real quick. Let me say something real quick. Okay. Excuse me, uh, I just want to, in the interest of time, we like to encourage questions. Come on, come on up. If you have a question, if you could just please get closer to the questions rather than making statements and remarks. Thank you all. Thank you all for participating. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lori Watson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Watson Foundation. And Gary, I have a twofold question for you. First of all, I want to know if this was proposed in 2015, where were the meetings, where was the acrimony, where was the dissension for three years? Then after you answer that, I want to know why is it that there's no commonality, why we can't break common bread, why we can't come together for the elderly, for the disabled, and for the disenfranchised in this community. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> As we were doing our transportation services study, we felt like we gave the, the community ample opportunity to respond. Uh, we had the online survey, which over a thousand people participated in. We went to many community events and talked to people on a one-on-one -on -one basis about it. Uh, we talked to a lot of community leaders. So we, we felt like we re got really good input uh, during our, our study. Well, and where were all the no buses signs? Where was all the dust up? Where were all these people <laughs> raising all this hell? I, I, I can't answer that question for you. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's rhetorical. So, we're good. Wait for our next guest. Hello. Hi, good evening. My name is um, Councilwoman Dr. LaShawn Burr Danley. I am um, Councilwoman for the city of Douglasville, and I am the chairperson of transportation, and I have been the chairperson of transportation um, for the city now for probably about six years. I just want to, um, first of all, I'm sorry, um, to Madam Chair and to um, the appointed officials that are here and to our sheriff. Thank you so much for having this meeting. I just want to say that I'm, I'm very glad that you are having this meeting because this is the first time, first time that we've had this large of a meeting so that we can all air our comments and our questions. So I do appreciate you um, making it available for us. I want to say for those of you that had questions specifically about the city of Douglasville, I'll be here a little bit afterwards in regards to um, Highway 92, the ending of that. You can find that on our website. I did want to, I know this is a, you, you asked for questions, but I just wanted to make sure. I'll be here afterwards if you'd like to ask me of those questions. Also, I want to say nobody gave me the, um, the 
email in regards to wearing red, but I wanted to let you know that I do support the transportation, and i tell you why. I grew up on the north side of town, which is now we recognize that as New Horizon, and there was no fire station on that side of town when I was younger. So when the train comes, and it still comes, and it stopped. So when it stopped, we couldn't get across. As a result of that, and this is one of the reasons why I ran for office, as a result of that, our house burned down to the ground, and we were lost, left with nothing. So for those that complain about transportation and not being able to get around, I've lived it, I've seen it, and still live in it. For those of you that still live in Ward 3, District 1, Commissioner Mitchell is my district um, chairperson, commissioner. And whenever I have questions, I don't wait for him to come and tell me, I ask him. Right. I pick up the phone and I call. Right. So I, I may not attend every meeting, but when I want to know something, I don't wait for the county to ask me, I go to you. So for those that don't do that, please be involved. But I just wanna say that for those that live in Ward 3, Post 1, District 1, on the other side, we are still dealing with Highway 92 not being completed. There are still days, right now the, the Mosley Street crossing is closed. So we have to take three and four um, transportation or three and four railroad crossings down. So I just wanna say, be patient just a little bit. Let them continue the job. It may work, it may not. But I just wanna say for transportation, Thank you for what you're doing, and if you can bring better transportation so that we can just get across the railroad tracks, thank you for that. Good evening, Madam Chair. Thank you for having this meeting. Madam Chair, on May 16, 2017, the board voted on a resolution to go to ARC. With that resolution was the CMAC grant application. The board voted on it. Am I correct? I need to look back. That sounds about right. Board voted on it. Okay. We go further down the road. I was actually at the meeting where it was presented at the transportation meeting. Three people sat there and said, we can do this. It doesn't have to go back before the board. Gary, you said it was laid on the table at a commission meeting. Was it discussed and voted on at that meeting? When you laid the four routes on the table after the transportation meeting, when you brought it in and laid it on the table, did they discuss it and did they vote on it? Are you talking about at the, count, at the work session? Yes, sir. Was it discussed? No. It, it, I presented it to them. It was discussed as best I remember. There, as best I remember, there was no, no, no formal vote on it. So are we to assume that from now on, somebody can come in and make a presentation and lay it on the table and it's okay to go do it? Because your committee submitted that. You said yourself in an open records request that I did that you supplied a supplement to ARC, to the CMAC grant. A supplement is a, an amendment to that application. Anywhere else, if somebody fills out an application and somebody supplements it, it's null and void. But I guess here in the county, you can supplement and amend applications and it's okay when the board never voted on it. All right, you say $400,000 in ridership. I did an open records request to find out how you calculated that. You sent back to me, we have no records responsive to your request. How are you calculating $400,000 in ridership? You've got no basis to figure it from. You have never set a fee per rider. What do you think the fee per rider will be? My, my guess would be anywhere from $1.50 to $2.50 one way. So you're going to get 400000 a year out of that. That kind of reminds me of Boundary Waters that's losing $600,000 a year. The people using it doesn't pay to use it. It's a loss. And I predict this will be a loss. Thank you.
evening. My name is Christy Peters. I'm a resident of Douglas County. I grew up with the public transit system in New York City. Um, I now live in Douglas County. I've been a resident for five years. And I just want to say that I really support uh, the mass public transportation here in Douglas County. One thing that doesn't change is what? Change. And Douglas County is a very, very fast growing county. It's an amazing county. I'm very impressed with it. And I think that uh, we need to kind of roll with the punches and accommodate this, this population. I think some of the folks who oppose this argument is underlining the point to support it. The main complaint is traffic. Keep your car at home, hop on the bus. It's a, it's a case of ethics. I heard the word ethics. It's a case of ethics and politics. I can't tell you how many times I've I picked up strangers and gave them a ride because they were walk any witnesses? Because they were walking two and three miles. It's a case of morality. I know of a person who had five loaves of fish and turned to 5,000. God is going to take care of our county. We already were blessed with three years of funding. So let's think about that teenager who has nothing to do and need access to employment. That senior citizen who wants to get out the house and look at that beautiful water fountain on Broad Street. Thank you. All right. <laughs> yeah, all my head hurts. I had this amazing, beautiful speech prepared and I'm just gone. Um, the study that we keep talking about how we did such a good job letting everybody know and why didn't we say anything back then? 1,400 people were, were, were surveyed. That's less than 1% of Douglas County population. So that's why we didn't say anything. Another reason why we didn't say anything until now is because of the changes. I think one to two routes starting on a small scale, what we originally talked about and what was originally approved by the BOC is a great idea. I think that'll help students. I think it'll help the disabled. I think it'll help a lot of people. Now students, you gotta remember, you gotta walk about two miles to get to a bus stop. But that's okay, you hop on that bus and you go look at the fountain and all that. <laughs> now, it also hurts my head, there's no fit feasibility study done, so we don't know what the fair amount's going to be, and we don't know how we're going to pay for that 400000 We can stop the morphing and the madness if we refuse the CMAC and go with the one, one to two routes that we originally, that originally was approved, and that's my question. Can we stop the madness? Can we go with what was approved? And can we all get out of here and go get a, a Pepsi or, or a Coke? Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jeff Barnegam. I've been in the county since 1977. Hello, okay, can you hear me now? Okay. The video you showed earlier the guy said, private industry, uh, I'm not good at public speaking, but you know, he's talking about private industry, running the, uh, the seniors, getting the seniors, taking them to the doctors, and technology. Well, it's three years later, you know, from 2015, we have the technology. We have the private industry. Open your eyes. Uber. Have vet the elderly people who need the rides and the disabled. Have them on the list. Give them a phone number to call. When they need a ride to the doctor, you, they call the Uber for you. The county pays for it. It'd be about $8 one way. My mother can't get to this bus route. Even when the bus route came to her, they, above our neighborhood on Storts Mill. She can't walk from her house to the top of the neighborhood. She, she has a cane. So this bus route, how do you expect people to get to it? Well, <clears throat> part, there's two potentials 
to that. One will either be looking at, at flex zone service, which would provide door to door service to people who qualify for it, disabled individuals and seniors, or we, we will also may offer, offer uh, ADA uh, complimentary paratransit service. Well, is that private we, industry? We, no, that that would be part of the bus system, and they they uh, the pa complimentary paratransit service would take the individual to a, a bus stop to where they could get on the bus and then go to their destination. Right, well, if you use like for people who can move, if you use Uber, you don't have to pay for the insurance, don't have to pay for the car, don't even have to pay for the employee. I mean, it's a no-brainer. I have friends who use Uber, and they have yet to get the same Uber driver in Douglasville every time they need one. And they use it regularly. So look out, look, there's plenty of them. You got Lyft operating here in Douglas County. We can set an example for all these other counties and use the resources that are available and use the technology. Put your hands to work here. And it's no sweat off our shoulders. It's just private industry helping people. Okay. Hi. Good evening. Um, I'm Crystal Hales. I am a Douglas County resident. And I'm sure, like a lot of people here, um, I'm very sensitive to the needs of seniors and underserved people in the community. But I'm also paying over $5,000 in property taxes for a failing school system. So, I'd like, oh, school zone. So, I, I'd kind of like to echo the sentiment of, of this woman right here. Um, when we look at an extended cost of this system, um, this is a proposal that has been affected by significant scope creep. It's gone from 500000 to potentially $2 million a year to run. So, if we look at a five year cost, we have three years funded. We're looking at a minimum of a $4 million cost for five years. If we simply decline the grant, and fund it ourselves, we're looking at less than $3 million. So why not simply decline the grant, start with a small system that was originally envisioned, and grow from there? I, I, I don't have any response to that. The Madam Chair may want to address it. But I, I don't have a comment. On, on that piece of paper. Let me try to take a stab at it. That was a good question, and I appreciate your dialogue. Can you hear me now? I don't think it's working. Hold on, we're gonna check. We're gonna check. Which, give me a check. I think the battery died, but can you hear me now? Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. It was a good question, and I appreciate you saying that. With that $500,000, also, if you say put it on the backs of the taxpayers, remember we have some grants that's going to require. So, it's, so we just give you the soft cost with that $500,000, but you got to get the bus stops and uh, the little benches and things that are required. That's going to be more. So that's going to put a lot of pressure on the taxes. And you're saying, why don't we have to do it? Sure, we'll raise the millage rate and make it easy. I can go home as a wrap. But trying to keep the pressure off you and your taxes, because I know you're saying 500000 but that's soft cost. And when we, when we add everything else, it may be a million a year to continue to operate. But it's going to be on the tax. It will be on the backs of the taxpayer, that million. Right now, our general fund is, I said, right now is healthy. It's, it's healthy enough, but not healthy enough for me to put, to take, or should I say for me and my fellow commissioners to take $1.4 million out of the the, the general fund. And with that being said, it's just not, I don't want to bother it not right now. We talked about some things that are coming down the pike, which I talked about switch. And you know, I just, I'm, and all of us have different opinions and different views, but you know, some see right here, some see big picture back and forth. So tonight it was just really not uh, a night for debate, certainly for you to express your opinions. I wanted to make sure I provided great information and open up the forum and the door and allow you to, to sit down and just tell us how you felt. And I'm definitely, I'm, I'm quite sure we've recorded this. I'll share this with our 
with our, my fellow commissioners because this is my town hall meeting tonight and they, they have theirs coming up. But I really appreciate what y'all have done. You've opened my eyes again. Like I said, I was not here in 2015. So what I'm trying to do is just take the pressure off us. But we could go with the one poor, because when he add all the soft cars, it costs all those grants go away because you still, the buses were funded by our grant. So those buses weren't paid for by taxpayers' dollars. They were paid for by a grant. And all your little extra components and all your little soft costs, that's grant funded. The, so right now we're in play with the federal government, but if the fellow, federal government say, I'm gonna get out of y'all's way and let you just have that, I think if they get out of our way, we're gonna be in trouble. So with uh, being said, I don't want them to get out of our way because we can't fund it off the back of that, of that, that general fund. So that's my response. I can't make everybody happy. And I knew when I was sworn in that I was going to have to do what I could do to just support the citizens. I inherited this. I'm managing the cards I've been dealt. And uh, my fellow commissioners are probably at home watching TV tonight. And I took a chance on luck, uh, nervousness. And I said, what have I done? Because I have a huge crowd here. And a crowd that's really mad in some, most, in some instances, but they mad at the wrong person. I am just the messenger. Right, right. The, 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 right. OK. Yes. OK, so you next. OK, thank you. You next. Microphone over here is not working. We want to thank our uh, Can you hear me? station manager and technical director, TJ Jaglinski, for uh, making this repair. Test, test. senior citizens and it sounds like the common ground here is that we want to go back to the original plan and start small and help our senior citizens and this plan that involves MARTA and this bigger plan was never our plan in the first place. The grant has forced this on us from, from my understanding from listening to everything so why should we let them force us how we want to expand if we want to start with our senior citizens why can't we? And if that's what we want to do, and if there are enough people who want that, what is our next step? Do we petition to say we want to go to the, the other plan, or what, what else can we do other than express our views in this way? What do you want us to do? You want to answer? I'll, I'll <clears throat> take another stab at it. Um, well, again, I know you just asked a $35 million question, what do I want us to do? I wanted us to be in this room in 2015 and we weren't here. And we're not here, again, like I said, I don't have veto power. Uh, we certainly could go with the $1.5 million, what it'd be in total, the, the, the 500,000 that you're talking about, and then talk about the soft cost that's involved. And when I looked at the big picture, it's, it, it, it's gonna hit that general fund. Do we need to and wait for Google? And I talked about two things, and I think everybody has just dismissed me totally. I said, if the county does not get a grant, I made it very obvious, very blatant, and very clear. Douglas County, and it took a lot of, lot of strength for me to say that to my fellow commissioners. I said, we won't go forward without the movement of this grant to take the pressure off our citizens. And I talked about then what? I said, if, if it does not work, and I think what's happening when you got your own opinion, I, I, this the night was just basically con, uh, opinion uh, session and uh, consensus because everybody's going to leave here with the same uh, idea and the same uh, perception as you did when you walked in the door. But I wanted to take the time to open up the doors, tell you what the plan was, to take the pressure. And I keep saying I'm trying to take the pressure off the taxpayers and if it does not work because they're little baby buses, they can go back into our regular fleet. No skin in the game, unlike Cobb County, who has 60 passenger buses. They don't have where to put those buses, those 60 uh, passenger uh, buses that are in the fleet. So I, I just don't know if I have a good answer, but my answer is, is at this particular time, if 
we don't get the grant, we don't go forward. If we get the grant three year period, we talked about just trying what's already been placed at my feet. We will just do what, just that and then after that, if it doesn't go work well, we'll cut it off. And that's the best I can give you in terms of response. I'm not, I don't have the entire uh, board of commissioners here with me to respond to that, but I'm just giving you an idea. I came in in 2017 and this is what I was faced with. And then I, I know you're asking me to stop things. I could have stopped the animal shelter, the new shelter, so let's stop that thing in midstream. But I carried it all the way through because it was always already in progress. The tax office and the tax assessor's office and the fleet office, I had to carry it all the way through. When your presidents inherit a war, they just don't go in and stop a war and just stop it. I gotta play it all the way through, but I'm trying to play it at a point where you don't feel any pressure. Thus far, I, I think what I've done is prove to you that I won't raise your taxes. And believe, when, believe me, when, those, when the millage rate, we had a choice to raise that millage rate in August. I had three commissioners who tried to paint me in a corner. And I said, I am not bossed. No one will boss me. You can't, the two things that I'm not. You, I'm not bossed and I'm not bought. So I told them, I said, we're not, we're not raising taxes. I said, so let's think of something else. So they kept thinking because it's easy to raise taxes, all you have to do is talk to my finance director, she pushed the button and said, let's go three meals. One meal equals four million dollars. So if we said we need three meals, that's 12 million dollars off your back. Because where were we in 2013 when they raised that millage rate? 23.8%, that was, that was a lot of, that was pretty high. And that put pressure on the taxpayer. So my goal at every turn is to take the pressure off the taxpayer. And that's all I, I have to say. And you have something for us, sir, because we're running a little tight on time. Okay. Madam Chairman, I want to thank you for, um, for your honesty. I want to thank you for your courage to face this crowd. Um, I think there's a lot of angry people on both sides, and everybody can see that. Um, some people believe that everybody else should pay for their ride, that they should get a free ride. Some people believe that they shouldn't help anybody else get a ride when they need help. And that's pretty clear. There's two sides on this. But I want to thank you for, um, especially because you have been appointed by God as our leader. And we trust you. And I'm praying for you. I'm the 13th congressional district chairman for the Republican Party, but I'm praying for you, Madam Chairman, and I want you to know that I'm not praying against you, I'm praying for you. Thank you. And as long as God continues to give y'all strength to be honest and to lead as servants with true servant leadership, we will continue to pray for you and to support you, and I don't have any anger and any hatred towards you right now, I want you to know that. I'm praying for you. I know this is really, really hard, and I, and I don't believe that socialism and redistribution of the wealth, I mean, that's why I chose the Republican Party, but <laughs> we have differing philosophies, but you have taken the time to have this here tonight, and I'm very thankful that you're transparent enough to stand here before us and, and, and take it and listen to us, and I hope that it is sincere and that there's real honesty going on, and that it's not just listening and then going back, you know, but that there will be really good resolve and consideration of these uh, taxpaying citizens' yes, concerns. Thank you. Yes, how many people, how many more uh, citizens do we have? In two, 25. okay. I think we should, we'll be, we'll make our 930 deadline. Thank, thank you so you. much. You're welcome. I just wanted to say thank you very much for hosting us this evening. Is that Julie? Thanks, Julie. Uh, I promised myself I was not going to speak tonight, so I have absolutely nothing written down. I have no questions, but I cannot allow myself to go home without telling you how my heart feels. My name is Nicole Miller. I was born and raised here. My grandmother's family moved here in the early 50s from Miami. My grandfather was born in a farmhouse off of Anawakee. We were raised to go to school, get a job, go out into the workforce, to go where God leads you. And then as far as politics go, I was taught to 
elect the people who you trust to be your voice. And so when people keep saying, well, where were you in 2015? You were sleeping. No, we had entrusted our elected officials to be our voice. Mm -hmm. And so a few months ago when my husband comes home and says, hey, we're getting a bus system in town, downtown Douglasville. Like, we are? Are you sure? Yes. So I, I can't go home without letting you know that this bus system, I'm not completely against transportation. I'm against this lack of transparency and the lack of planning in this plan. Mm -hmm. I feel that we could use the transportation, but it seems as though the people who need it, the, these buses aren't going to get to them. So the buses are going to go down our street where my son plays, where I already can't get out of the driveway to go pick him up from school or to go to the grocery store. Well, you've got other people who are going to be trying to walk two miles to get to the bus. And if it is a non-ambulatory person, well then how are they gonna get there anyways? So then that brings up something as simple as Uber. I like to take Uber. I do it a lot around Douglasville. You're talking three to four dollars per ride from my house across town. That's it. I just feel like this is a lack of transparency and a lack of planning. And we put all of our faith in you guys and the way I understand it, if we take this grant, then these four proposed routes are what we have to do. Four. Mm -hmm. And at this point, if we don't take this grant, then we can start over from scratch and work on something that will work for our community, <coughs> something that the residents are all aware of, something that we can all plan on together and we can all feel good about. And because if this does fail, then we have brick and mortar bus stops in our yards on Campbellton Street. Who's gonna take those down? What's gonna happen to them then when the grants run out? And then the talk about the grants, that's federal grants. That's not free money. We pay that as taxpayers. That comes out of our trust. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, thank you. Oh, you. Thank you. And you know the Campbellton uh, route that has been removed. Uh, if you read, did you read your little leaflet that said that route has been moved? Yes. We took that, I heard some. So no Campbellton Street. Yeah, right now that has been removed. No Campbellton. No, no Campbellton, Campbellton Street. So no, no Campbellton Street at all. So we Campbellton to Selman. No. It's, well, that, that's not, well, he, well he, 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 it yeah. just seems like we don't have enough information to even know what's going on. We don't know the, the we don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know how much it's going to cost to get on the bus. We don't know how much that ride is actually going to cost the city. We don't know where the actual bus stops are going to go. We don't know where the buses are going to ride around to. We don't know how the people are going to get on the buses. We don't know who's going to pick up the trash. We don't know anything, and yet we're told that we're going to do it anyways. It well, just seems like we need to stop and think about this. Well, our, this seems very <coughs> destructive. Our, it, our directive has been to wait to see if we get the CMAC grant. But if we get the CMAC, we're, we're locked into those four rounds. Once, once we get the CMAC grant, we'll be able to start answering some of these other questions. We'll be able... But then it's too late. It's it is what late. it is. We, we... Okay, well, I've told you my piece. That's my heart. Okay. Thank you guys all. I'm not mad at any of you. I just need you guys to understand... As a resident, as a lifetime resident, I'm not okay with this. And I entrusted all of you to take care of us and my family. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Let, let, let me say this. Campbellton Street is off the table. There are no buses going down Campbellton Street. The downtown route goes up Fairburn Road to Church Street goes down to Club Drive, down to Selman Drive, where it can serve the library and the health center, two crucial spots to be served uh, for the community. Then we go across, we hit Rose Avenue, go up uh, to the highway, go across the railroad tracks, and then go up and serve the north part of town. Okay, good evening. My name is Darlene Sheridan. And I'm a real active person in this community. I'm a homeowner, been here 17 years. And I have an opportunity to be in touch with people who have great needs that you could never imagine, who are really trying to get their lives together. It means going to a job that pays $10 an hour, 
it still takes some people transportation. But what I read, and I kept up with both sides of the issues on many of the social media platforms, but it hasn't been said here, but it's been on these platforms that people are worried about crime. They are calling this city Douglasville, Clayville. They are saying we don't want the sewage coming out of H.E. homes. So for some reason, people believe it will increase the crime in this area. Maybe they're not here tonight, but that's a lot of things that have been written on a lot of these social platforms. So my question is, with people coming in, small amounts, 12, 15 people, are there places, are there things in place to make sure that, you know, some of the bus stops in these areas are monitored for safety? <laughs> the, they, the bus stops would be monitored uh, by the sheriff's office and the city police, just as, as any location would be. We're not we're not if it, we're not going to have a dedicated security force, no man. I understand. I'm just saying generally overall. I mean, I believe the police department. It was said earlier today, have done a great job in keeping Douglasville safe and Douglas County. And I just want to just put it out there because I didn't hear it said. I didn't hear it, but I read it all the time. I try to listen to both sides be objective, but there are some things being written that sounds like people have fear of possibly people coming in this county that may cause harm. Hi, I just want to address those concerns, uh, especially as Director of Communications, and uh, address what you may be reading on social media. Um, I've just come to this position uh, in Douglas County but before I came, I specialized uh, in being a journalist and covering stories. Uh, gathering facts and information as a senior news manager. Everything you read is not the truth, especially social media, okay? Everything you read is not always the truth. It's a platform like anything. But what I wanna encourage you to do is anything you do read, you do have the freedom to request that information and ask questions and get the answers. And that's what you're doing now. You're here participating in a listening session that Chairman Jones is spearheading. You know, I encourage everyone to gather their own facts and information and check information they receive. But again, I wanna reiterate that everything you read on social media platforms is not always true. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm, it's, I'm excited about sure. this bus route. Okay. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to represent uh, Representative Michael Grayley, Gravely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I bleed red, put my pants on just like all of you, so. It is an honor for me to be here indeed. Uh, my name is Micah Gravely, Madam Chair. Members of the panel, thank you so much for being here, for orchestrating public dialogue on this. Uh, I represent the western part of Douglas County, the far reaches of that western corridor, from Ephesus Church, Clinton Park, Bill Arp Community. I serve on the Appropriations Committee at the State House, and one of our largest appropriations at times is maintenance of vehicles. It's the acquisition of vehicles. As the state, we go through a lot of them. My request here tonight, and I'm going to do what the director said with communications, I'm going to exercise that freedom to ask for some information. Because when we bring a bill to the State House, a lot of times the first question that's asked is what's the fiscal note? What's the impact, the financial impact to the state? What is this going to cost the state in the short term and the long term? I'm not against transportation. I was at a, uh, a groundbreaking for the 92 ceremony in Douglasville. Just last week, the 92 ceremony groundbreaking um, in Paulding County. But I did vote against the transportation bill that we had two years ago. I was at a level that I could go that I felt the taxation would be fine. It went higher than that. So what I, my request tonight is, can I get a copy of a financial imprint, the impact study, what this is going to cost long term to the citizens of Douglas County, specifically my citizens on the west side who aren't going to have access to this 
but that are going to bear the financial burden long term. And, and here's what I'm going to say. And I understand federal grants can come. The state gets them. A lot of our dollars are passed through dollars. But when that runs out, we're, we're responsible for that as a mm -hmm. state, as a city, as a county. And a lot of times when we deal with the ARC, another fear that I have is, well, if, if, if one grant runs out and we apply for another one, the parameters of qualification around the second grant application could be, well, you'll need to extend your routes into this area or your footprint will need to get larger to accommodate this grant. So again, I commend you for being here. My, my purpose is mm -hmm. to look out for my citizens, mm -hmm. those citizens in House District 67. Mm -hmm. I would like to review. I would like to look at the long-term financial impact. If you don't have that, maybe the short-term financial impact. Okay. But I thank you for being here, for opening up this forum. Thank you for conducting yourself in a professional manner. Thank you for the, the folks that did speak with the information that I guess that they had. But I do want to know because these citizens entrusted me mm -hmm. to be their voice. I was at the Capitol when this started. Mm -hmm. I got a live feed. Someone gave it to me. I listened to it. I didn't watch it. But I listened to it on the way here. And I get here and the meeting's still going on. Mm -hmm. And my biggest concern is what's the cost to the taxpayers that I represent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Well, I would like to thank, I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I'm sorry that we took three hours of your time, but it was worthy of your three hours. And you will hear more from us in the future regarding this um, proposed bus system. And thank you and have a good night. It's 9.30 on the nose. Thank you.